And the first thing I did on television professionally was a commercial. And so eventually... Commercial for what? I think it was a Schick Razor. They didn't have teleprompter and uh, didn't have the staff on a Sunday afternoon to come in there and, and do anything like uh, uh, the uh, cue cards. And, and so I had to memorize it and hold a razor and walked over there and it, I got the same thrill out of it. It was, it was the first time I was on radio. First time I was on radio, I did what you said. The only thing I said was Radio Columbus, WTDAK, 11 o'clock. That was it. And, and then Ed Snyder did his music program, his disc jockey show. And so the first thing I did on television, I got the same buzz, you know. It's like I was electrified through my body. And I said, I oh, know this is it. That probably is the biggest story I ever broke. Uh, I've broken a few important stories, but that one got such worldwide coverage and, uh, and attention. And, and because of the subject and because people had been trying for years and years to get him and were unsuccessful, basically, uh, it, it turned out to be uh, quite a story. It was interesting, you know, because before this interview is over, we're going to get into investigative reporting. And I didn't have to do investigative reporting to, to have this really, really big story. All I had to do was sit in a Kiwanis Club meeting and listen to him talk. And what he said was definitely newsworthy, you know, to apologize for that. And all the worldwide reaction that he got to it, uh, it was just, it's being in the right place in the right time quite often. It was supplying a heck of a lot of news and the people were being informed. They were learning what was going on in that state government that affected their lives every day. Let me tell you, that's where the action is. The action is down at City Hall, the action is at the school board, the action is in Atlanta, at the state capitol, and those are the things that really affect your lives and they're not getting enough coverage in Columbus, not in my view. Uh, You've done it some, you've gone up there some, they assigned it to you for a while, if I remember correctly, and that's the way to do it. You have to be there, you have to meet these people, you have to know these people, you have to find out what they're going to do. What would you have said in 1948 if somebody had told you you're going to be a blogger one day? 48, I have no idea what they were talking about. Uh, that, that was not on the horizon, it was a whole different ball game. And uh, I had no idea I would, would ever be doing that. And, and it's an interesting concept because, you know, I think somebody once said, yes, we have a free press if you own the press. And so the difference is now that you can own the press pretty easily. I mean, all you have to do is get online and they can read what you write all over the world. I just got a comment yesterday from somebody in London on a blog I just did. That idea that you have a responsibility to this community. You are the fourth estate, so to speak. Free press is extremely important to democracy. And you have not just a job to make money for that station and for you. That is a job. You have to have groceries. You got to pay the rent. But you have a job to inform the republic, the public in this democracy. And for democracy, Jefferson, you know all the business about Jefferson and what he said about newspapers and democracy. And you have to have it. You have to have the balance. You have to have watchdog journalism. If you're doing your job, you don't just report the surface. You don't report the police report. Story after story after story. And, you know, the, the local crime story if after it bleed, story if it, after story. If, so you saw the beginning of If It Bleeds, It Leads. Of course. It, it does. And it's, it, it did and it still does. And, 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 and that's true. But, and I don't, I don't mind reporting what, the, what happens on the police beat. I, you know, people want to know these, these things. But you have, to, you have to consider the stories that really affect lives. Now, if you have a crime wave, if it's really, really a big, big problem, and you're living in fear in your community, you've got a big story. I mean, that's a community-wide social moral issue. Criminal. Right? Serious newsmaker. The guy that gets the most attention. Right? Uh, so, 
from that, using that definition, who is it? It's obvious, right? And uh, so the, the most serious newsmaker as far as getting international coverage and attention as well as in Columbus, Georgia, where it was a huge, huge story of black life, was William Cowley. And, uh, and all the fallout from that, that's a big deal. Uh, now, in other areas, that's, you know, I probably need a little time to think about that because there were... Would Carlton Gary fall into that category? He would. Uh, he would. I mean, uh, uh, that whole story, that's one of the biggest stories we ever covered. Oh, that was horrible. That was a story I wanted to be over. And, and our ratings shot through the roof during the stocking strangling coverage. We had over 50 shares. And you almost don't do that. And, and uh, so people wanted to know what was going on. It was crucial. They were afraid. This, this hysteria was in this town. Since you've retired, you have become more open about your political philosophy. I did for a little while. Uh, Are you conservative, Democrat, Republican? I'm conservative fiscally, I like to think. And I'm uh, liberal socially. Did that ever show up in your reporting? In your I tried to guard against it. You know, anyone who says they're completely objective is lying. Uh, you try to be, and you hope you are. And sometimes you, you even err on the wrong side, so to speak. You, even, you come out and the story would be favoring the side you don't favor because you want to be fair. You'll go that far. And it's like... I thought I was the only one that did that. Well, that right, times. you'll do that. You, you know, you, you want it to be... You want to be a good reporter. You want to be as objective as you can. You want people to believe you. You want people to trust you. That's the key. Walter Cronkite, the most trusted man in America. And I've had people tell me people, folks, trusted me. I've heard you called the most trusted guy in news in Columbus. Well, I, you know, that's always good to hear. Uh, I tried to be. I made a big, big effort to be fair, and and that brings up some interesting questions. Being fair, because say you have something that comes out like like climate warming, like climate change, and and so you talk to this scientist, and he's telling you all of these reasons, scientific reasons that yes, it's happening. You know, and he shows you these charts and gets into math and so forth and and so forth and and you think, well, that kind of balance this because some people are saying this is a hoax, and uh, so I'm going to get this guy over here who I know is opposed to this, and I'm going to balance this scientist with this guy. And okay, 97 percent or more. Scientists agree that climate change is real. I got this one guy over here who said, ah, oh, it's a big liberal hoax. And I'm going to put him on to balance this scientist. And should I do that? Should I let give him the same amount of time that I give a scientist, somebody that's just opinion, who can't back it up scientifically? Should I really do that? Now, I'm, I made that mistake, if it is a mistake. I mean, it just depends on how you view it. I'm sure I did, because I, I did want to balance, and I always wanted to get the other side. But that brings up a really interesting question as, as, to, as to how far you go with that, and how far it's honest to go with that. But I met a, a number of really, really interesting people. Uh, uh, Jack Gibney was an interesting guy. Uh, Jack Gibney taught me how to shoot film, and, and he had been a radio announcer back in the 30s at WRBL, and he did the ball games. He did the Columbus Redbirds. That was a big deal back then. People listened to those ball games on the radio, and, and you had to recreate uh, ball games that were out of town. You'd, you'd sit there, and, and they, would, they would send you a little telegraph strip that would just tell you the basics is what's, what's happening, you know, like Joe Smith is up to bat. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Strike one. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Ball one. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Like that. Well, in the meantime, 
You had to make up the rest. You had to keep it going like you're in the ballpark. And it was called a recreation. And uh, it was interesting to do that. They, it was so interesting that they, United, United Oil was uh, sponsoring it. And they had, a, they had a facility on, I think, on First, First, First Avenue. And they had a, a glass in the showroom. And they, they set him up in this glass room showroom with a table and a microphone and that, that wire machine and that telegraph. And he sat there and did that. And then people would come and watch him through the window. And sound effects were kind of primitive, I guess, at that time for such things. So he had a pencil. And every time somebody got a hit, he'd slam the pencil down on the desk. And the microphone would pick up this click, you know, like a bat hitting a, hitting a ball. And, and Well, you know how the lead paragraph would be pretty standard, I'm sure, you know. But what do you want, what do you want to be said about you? Uh, golly, Chuck, that's a hard one. Uh, <laughs> Give me a chance to write your own obituary. Right, right. I don't know uh, if that's fair or not. I'm not sure that I can come up with one uh, that is, is that clever, but uh, I guess I would like for it to say that uh, he sincerely did try to uh, contribute to the welfare of the common good. <laughs>